those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he rode. And he rode. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave? They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does, he saves us. For the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could bear. He heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God, this is who he is. RCC, we're so glad that you guys are here this morning. You can have a seat. So this is my favorite Sunday of the year uh, because it is the Sunday that we get to celebrate the graduating class of 2023. So to do that effectively, yeah, I know, I'm excited, but don't waste those claps because we're gonna clap for them as they come out here in a second, but a couple of notes on that. So if you can do uh, the, the cool whistle that I'm so jealous of because I've never learned how to do it, yeah, some, yes, that. If you can do that, be, please be prepared. Like if you're a football mom and you have the cowbell in your purse, go ahead and get that out. And like everybody go ahead and like put the golf clap back in your pocket and take the thunder clap out of your pocket because we wanna celebrate these kids with just a lot of noise as they come out onto the stage. Everybody, let's celebrate the class of 2023. Oh, I love it. 
love it. I love it. Okay. So a couple of things, we're, we're gonna, in a moment, we're gonna uh, say some words of blessing over these students and then uh, they're gonna join their parents down on the floor in front of the stage and we're gonna sing a blessing over them and I'm super excited about that. But I just wanted to say a couple of words uh, for them before we do that. So these students, um, the thing that impresses me about them and why I'm so excited for this morning is that they, have, they know Jesus, they have the heart of Jesus in their lives, yeah. And, I, I am so excited for them to take what they know, to take the love of Jesus that they live in daily and go out into the world and, and share the gospel through their lives and, and, and through the message that God has given each of them. I'm just so excited for what's next for them. But we know that they didn't get here on their own, that it takes godly parents that love and shape and mold and pray over and hold these kids when they're hurting and all those things. And we just wanna celebrate all of the parents that are in the room this morning. So if you're a parent of one of these students, would you please stand and let this church celebrate you and let these students thank you? We are so thankful for you guys this morning. Okay, parents, please remain standing. Please remain standing because we know that you didn't uh, get here all by yourself, that, that it takes more than just parents to get kids to understand the heart of Jesus and to walk in him like these students are doing in their world. So we also wanna celebrate aunts, uncles, grandparents, close family friends. If you're here and celebrating one of these students this morning as a member or a close friend of this family, would you, uh, a family of one of these students, would you please stand and let us celebrate you as well? Let's, let's celebrate siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins. Man, we're so thankful for y'all. Okay, there's two more groups that I wanna recognize and, the, and this next one is super special to me. And it's if you were a Bible class teacher, a coach, a teacher at school, or a small group leader, if you walked with these kids daily or weekly, um, and I think you have a special influence in their life, would you go ahead and stand and let us recognize uh, the influence that you have in their world as well. We are so thankful for you guys. Thank y'all. Okay, and lastly, I think it takes a church. I think it takes the influence of a church. I think it takes showing up on Sunday mornings and worshiping next to these students. I think it takes encouraging them with your presence, encouraging them uh, with your time. It takes us tithing to get these kids to camp in Tennessee and to, and to provide all the experiences that they get to do. And it's every single one of you that have participated in getting our seniors to where they're at in their faith and in their life today. So church, would you please stand and let's celebrate all together what God is doing through these kids and through this church family. Okay guys, now that we're all standing, um, I wanna speak a few words of blessing over these students as a church body before they go on to whatever is next in their world. So we're gonna say these words, we're gonna celebrate them one more time, say a prayer, and then their parents will come and join them. So uh, church, would you please repeat these words after me? We are proud of you. We love you. We believe in you. So go get them. All right, guys, let's celebrate one more time the class of 23. Woo! <laughs> All right, hey, family, if you wouldn't mind, just extend a hand and let's pray over these students together. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for these students. I thank you for, uh, for their parents. I thank you for godly parents that have raised them in you, that have uh, read the Bible with them, that have uh, had prayers at bedtimes and devotionals over dinner and long conversations in the car. Um, parents that have walked with them through hurts and through exciting times in their life. God, I just thank you so much for all of those moments um, within their family. God, I thank you for their extended family and how you've provided a ring of support around each of these students to grow them in the gospel and to grow them to be who they are today. God, I thank you for, for their church and for every encouraging person here. I thank you for their youth ministry and, and how they have shown up week to week and, and just um, got to learn and got to grow with, with 
other Christian friends and peers that love you and are walking with you, God, and I, and I am so thankful for who these students are today. God, we pray for what's next. We pray for the next steps that they will take, whether that's college or, or just journeying into adulthood. God, that they, they remember everything that you have taught them. They remember the moments of nearness and closeness that they've had with you, God, and that they walk with you into the next phase of life. God, we pray that they find a church. If they leave this community, that they find a church like this one that they can grow in and uh, continue to grow in their faith and also to serve and give back to. God, we know that each of these students has the heart of a servant, that they love um, serving in our kids' ministry and on the teams in this place. And, and God, we just want them to continue to do that. We pray that they continue to walk with you and carry with them uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they go, God. And we're so proud of and thankful for these students. God, we pray that you bless them. And God, as we end this prayer and we start to sing a prayer over them, that your people have been praying over each other since the time of Moses that comes out of Deuteronomy 6. God, I pray that, that you will be present in these words, that you will encourage the hearts of these students, and God, that they will really feel blessed by you and near you as they walk into the next phase of their life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Yeah. You guys are awesome students. If you would go ahead and head down in front of the stage, your parents will come up and join you, church. Let's sing these words of blessing over them.
Amen, church. Can we celebrate these students? <laughs> Amen. Hey, congratulations, guys. We're going to invite you to go back with your family and friends. Hey, if you're new with us today, we just want to welcome you here to RCC. We're just so grateful you're here. And if you're new with us, we'd love to say hello. There's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. You can take that and fill that out. We have a welcome center on the atrium, and we'd love for you to just visit that after service. We have a gift for you we'd like to give you. If you're joining with us online, welcome. We love our online family, and we'd love for you to fill that card out online as well. And on that same card, there's a place to request prayer. We are a praying church. We believe in the power of prayer. We pray all throughout the week. We have a prayer team who meets, and they're praying right now for this service and over our students in real time. And we just believe in the power of prayer, and we want to be praying for you in whatever season you're walking in. So go ahead and write that request down. There's crosses on either side of the room. You can submit that online and we will get it the same way and we'll just be praying for you throughout this week. And then finally, church, whether you are in the room or you're joining with us online, you can give towards what the Lord is doing here. Like Travis just said, Pastor Travis, is our, our generosity, it goes towards so many different so many different ministries that are happening here. We're able to send kids to camp. We're able to do amazing ministry throughout the week. We're able to come and have an amazing building that we can come as a church family and just celebrate the goodness of our God. And that all comes through the Lord's provision, but also through our church family giving towards what he is doing here. Is it amazing what God is doing here in this church family? Can we celebrate that? It really is. And so several ways on the screen that you can give towards what the Lord is doing here, okay? Thank you so much. We're gonna continue in worship and we're gonna enter into a time of communion. If you didn't receive the emblems as you came in, just go ahead and raise your hand. We have leaders across the room and they will bring those, they'll bring those to you. As we enter into this time of communion, we're gonna sing um, a new song today. And this is a song that is called Good Plans. And you know, throughout scripture, we, we recognize passage where it talks about, you know, God, working good in our lives, right? He's, he, he has plans for goodness, plans for us to prosper, not plans for perish, but he has plans for eternal life for us. He has plans for goodness of those who are called according to his purpose, right? We see this throughout scripture, but if you're anything like me, church, sometimes you can equate God's goodness with good things happening in life. And I'm reminded daily that just, that's just not the case, right? We live in a fallen world world and apart from Christ we have no hope but you see Christ in his very nature is good it's not just that we feel good or good things happen but Jesus God God alone in his nature is good and because of his goodness he offers us hope the Bible says that the things that we experience in this life have no comparison to the eternal glory that we are going to share with Christ Jesus in heaven amen so we can take hope we can have confidence in meeting together, church, as we come and as we celebrate our church family, as we celebrate in singing songs and through the teaching of his word and through giving. We can do that all because we have hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we take communion, we recognize that truth that we have. We recognize the gift of grace that he has given to us through the breaking of his body, the breaking of bread, through the shedding of his blood, the pouring out of the juice that we are about to take. We do that in recognition of Jesus giving his life so that we can have life in him. And so as we take communion, we wanna encourage you to rest in God's hope, rest in his goodness, not because everything in the world is good, but because God is good and because of his goodness, he extends grace and that grace offers us redemptive life, which outweighs anything that we experience in this world. Let me pray. God. We thank you for the gift of life that you give us through your son. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for this family, God, as we can come together and we can celebrate that truth through song and through teaching, God, through celebrating our students as they graduate. And Lord, just this church family is such an amazing place to be a part of. But Lord, we know that none of it exists unless your provision, your power is within it. And so God, may today be nothing for our own gain. May it be nothing for our own interests, but may it be everything 
in pointing people towards you, the advancement of your kingdom, God, the celebration of the good work that you've offered to us through your son. And Lord, as we continue to sing, may it not just be words that we sing out of routine, but may this be truth that we declare over our lives, over this town, over this nation, God, over this church family right here. May we declare this as truth. May we live by this. God, we give you the praise in Jesus' name.
Your faithfulness is walk beside me. Winter storms make way for spring. In every season, oh, where I'm standing, I see. Welcome all of our brothers and sisters online right now. Welcome all those people online. We love you guys. So glad to have you this morning. Have a seat, please. Have a seat. My name's Nathan. We want to welcome you to RCC. If you're first time here, make sure you come by and see us at the Welcome Center right after the service. And we'll remind you, we have First Coast Women's Services. We have Bibles that are going out to raise, uh, raise as much money as we can to save the lives of babies. And actually, it brings so many people to Christ, and we are honored to partner with them. RCC has the record of all-time uh, money raised to the bait bottle drive in $14,320. We set that last year. I think we can break it again, right? I think we can do that again. So I love seeing those baby bottles go up, go out. If you if you have ones already filled, go ahead and bring it in, and we'll reuse that. And so, because we need all the bottles we can get to raise as much as we can to save the lives of the next generation. On top of that, I want to encourage you with this, and that is um, three weeks ago we launched a baptism week, and uh, it started on Thursday night. We had 21 baptisms, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool in three weeks if we had at least 100 baptisms? 
Well, guess what happened uh, early uh, this past week? Uh, two, a couple was baptized, Anita and Charlie. And then on Thursday night, the 100th person was baptized, Lynn Powers. And then we had one more, 101st person, Alicia, was baptized on Thursday night. 101 people baptized in three weeks. And two, two years ago, we had 101 people total. We have now 101 people in three weeks. And so God is on the move. And one of the ways he's on the move is in a series called Anxious About Nothing. If you have one of the bracelets, put your hand in the air. I want to see if you have a bracelet on. Find the people going to heaven. All right, the people love Jesus. All right, if you don't have one, you want one, make sure you go to Welcome Center and grab one of those on your way out the door. We'd love for you to have one. And many of you have already handed them out to other people and you talked about anxiety. Now, let me kind of open up, talk about two boys who are in a hospital. And they're both in the hospital. One turns to the other and says, why are you here? He says, I'm here because I'm having my tonsils taken out. And the other kid says, oh, that's no problem at all. I had that done. And get a whole bunch of ice cream to send you home. It's great. And he says, well, so what are you here for? He says, I'm here because I'm getting something called circumcision done. And the boy had a look of horror on his face. And he says, I had that done once when I was a baby. I couldn't walk for a year. So every day, right, we're bombarded by messages that make us anxious, right? And it gets harder and harder and harder. And I want to be clear as we're talking about anxiety. I'm not talking about physiological issues. I'm not talking about deep trauma. Many of us need to get medication or, or counseling. And, and here at RCC, we totally look at that as good gifts from God that need to be stewarded. But we're talking about uh, what Jesus talked about in the Mount when he looked at a crowd and he said, you know, you guys uh, uh, believe that God is good and God is faithful and God is sovereign, so why are you worried about what if? Like, what am I going to wear and what am I going to drink and what am I going to eat? He says, I, I don't understand why you're so worried. And that's what we're talking about. Many of us, many of you have told me that it's kind of providential that, that we're talking about this right now. And here's the truth. Is there ever a season that we don't wrestle with anxiety. I mean, I could talk about this every year and it would still be relevant. I'm convinced that we can't talk about it too soon. We see it among teenagers as we're celebrating teenagers this, and what God is doing. Teenagers say one in three girls, one in four teenage boys suffer from significant amount of anxiety. In fact, it's the number one mental health issue right now on college campuses. But we can't talk about it soon enough because even kids in elementary school struggle with this. One administrator wrote in and emailed these words, I'm in school and I have children as young as first grade struggling with anxiety. The point is required therapy and medication. I have children talking about suicide. This is elementary kids. I had hoped that this was an issue that people struggled with that, that did not have faith, but last year I taught third graders at church and we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount and I tried to make the lesson appropriate for third grade level and at the end of the sermon I asked the kids, which topic is most meaningful to you? 80% said the part about worry. So I asked the kids, what are you worried about? Expecting childish responses. Most of them said this, I'm worried about my family's finances. I'm worried about mom and dad if they're going to get a divorce. I'm worried about dying. I'm worried about being alone. I'm worried about failing state tests. Third graders. I heard pain in their voices, she said, as they openly shared all that they were anxious about. And I was overwhelmed hearing about how so many of them were so burdened by worry. This isn't just kids, right? This is all, we're all pilgrims trying to break free of this prison called anxiety. But I believe we can be pilgrims making progress. I'm continuing in this series as Christians that we have spiritual resources available to us to live in peace. But Paul, let me remind you that Paul, when he wrote Philippians, was not writing from Club Med. He was writing from prison. And I want to give you the NFT translation. This is a Nathan Freeman translation of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. This is kind of how I've lived my life a little bit. Here's what I would write. Blame God. I'll say it again. Just blame God. Let your anxious be evident to all. The Lord is nowhere to be found. Stress out about everything. Big stuff, little stuff, things you can't control, things you wish you could, things that might come true and things that could never possibly happen. In every situation, see it as an opportunity to gripe to other people about how bad you've got it and how everyone else is kind of cruising through life. 
Allow your envy and self-preoccupation to blow the problem way out of proportion. Above all, never talk to God about it. He doesn't give a rip. And if you continue on this path, the anxiety that transcends all understanding will give you ulcers, heart disease, headaches, joint pain, and lousy relationships. Has anyone else been like that, all right, in their life besides me? I mean, that's kind of how I've operated in ways I don't want to even describe, but that was not Paul's perspective. Paul had a whole different perspective. When he was writing from prison, here are the actual words of Philippians chapter 4. Here's what Paul wrote. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. What? Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the what? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul is giving us steps to deal with anxiety. And here's one thing I want you to hear. When anxiety speaks, you can talk back. And so I'm going to give you an acronym. And this is the kind of acronym I'm using for the series. It's acrostic, I guess. It's, it's C stands for celebrate. We talked about that two weeks ago. Celebrating God's goodness and God is in control. And then last week we talked about ask. Be specific. Talk to God. Pray to God. Here's the thing, you can cast all your anxiety upon the Lord because He cares for you. And today we're going to talk about learn. Learn from L. Learn to be content. And M, we're going to, we're going to talk about, well, you'll have to come back in two weeks for that one, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to give you that one just now. But the idea when it comes to keeping calm is you can take responsibility. We can talk back. A professor was teaching his class one day, and he says, if I give you $86,400... And someone stole from you $10. Would you throw away the $86,390 because you lost the $10? And the class said no. And he said, okay, every day you're given 86,400 seconds. Time is more valuable than money. You can make more money. You can't make more time. And something comes along that upsets you or stresses you out, and it probably took you 10 seconds, right? Took, took 10 seconds to stress you out. Are you going to throw away the 86,390 seconds because of the 10? And that professor was teaching them that we don't always control outcomes, but we can control our outlook. I can't control outcomes, even though I think I can. But I can, I know I can control my outlook. Another way of saying it is this, the non-anxious life is a determination more than a destination. And this is the heart of the message. It's so important. Is calm a place or is peace calm a perspective? Because most of us, we treat it like a place. Most people think, well, when I get to this place, when they act right, whoever they are, you know, they may be, I, and I, I won't have this issue. When, and when that happens, then, then I'll be calm. Listen, if peace is a place, I got bad news for you. You're probably not going to find it. And if you actually did find it, you're probably not going to stay there very long. See, Paul did not fall into the trap of when, then thinking. Not when they act right, or when I get out, or when I feel better, his outlook was a decision. It was not a destination. Remember, he's writing from prison. He's writing from prison, and he kept calm, primarily because he learned something from God. He, here, here's the context. When you, when you were in prison that day, the state did not fund you, your clothes and your food. It had to be provided for for, for you from somebody on the outside. And so if you didn't have whatever that thing you needed, then you did without. Well, the church in Philippi heard that Paul was in prison. And so they wanted to be a blessing. And they sent him relief. And he's glad to get it. But he wants them to know that their level of generosity does not increase his level of joy. That he was not pacing the cell anxious. And he was not worried about tomorrow. Here's what Paul wrote. 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be, read it with me, church, I've learned to be what? Content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is, Paul says, to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have what? Read it with me. Learn the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul was not pacing in his cell. Paul was praising in his cell. He did not know if he was going to get out, but he did know that he was not going to run out of peace. See, it's not that life is good and that makes me content. It's that I am content, and that's what makes life good. By the way, that's the best thing I've said in the last five years. Someone say it again. It's not that life is good and that makes me content. It's that I'm content, and that's what makes life good. Let me put it this way. It's not that I got to this place and everything was so good and I was content. It's that I learned contentment and it made any place I was at good. And that kind of contentment, Paul says, can be learned. You have to learn this. This is not going to be something you just walk into. So you got to learn a, a couple things. Number one is this. We need to learn to be grateful. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Paul did not give us an expiration date on that, by the way. Here's the thing. Expose your worry to worship. One of the strongest expressions of worship is thanksgiving. Paul says in verse 6, do not worry about anything, but pray. Ask God for everything you need. Always what, church? Say it with me. Always what? Giving thanks. Now, Paul is not saying that you should never be anxious. He's saying you don't have to stay in perpetual state of anxiety. Take it to God. And when you take it to God, make sure you include a lot of thanksgiving. A lot of thanksgiving. Anxiety goes down when thanksgiving goes up. Say that with me. Anxiety goes down when thanksgiving goes up. And I'm a believer that anxiety and gratitude cannot coexist. You can't do both at the same time. Anxiety is about what if this and what if that and a future fear of something that may or may not actually happen. Gratitude is about present blessings that are actually going on right here, right now. But you cannot live in both worlds. There's some amazing research done on gratitude. It has some wonderful benefits. If it was a pill, if gratitude was a pill, it would be a wonder drug. Gratitude improves your health. You, you have less depression, less fatigue, less anxiety. Gratitude improves your physical and your mental health. Research shows you can actually reduce inflammation on a cellular level if you stay in a constant state of gratitude. Now, you sports fans, you'll recognize the guy up on the screen. His name is Mike Krzyzewski or Coach K, and I apologize to all the Kentucky Wildcat fans in the room, but, but whether you like him or not, you have to admit he is a great coach. He won five national championships while at Duke, and while he is going through the March Madness tournament, tournament, tournament in one year, he gives his basketball players each a basketball and a marker, and he tells them, I want you to write down all the people that helped you get here. Right now, write down all the people who drove you to practice, who coached you, teammates who passed you the ball, friends who supported you. I want you to carry this ball with, with you wherever you go with their names on it because I want you to play for others and not just play for yourself. Well, guess what happened? They won the tournament that year. They won the championship. And he said these words, I was trying to teach them to keep gratitude at the center of the game. See, that's the truth, church. We need to keep gratitude at the center of our game. Look what Paul said to the church that met in Thessalonica. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful. Read it with me. Be thankful in all circumstances. Not for, but in all circumstances. This is God's will for you who belong in Christ Jesus. So clearly, Paul believes we can change our attitude even if we cannot change our situation. You know what? That's the second, one of the greatest things I want to tell you, I want to tell you right now. We can silence our future fears by giving voice to our present blessings. 
We can silence our future fears by giving voice to our present blessings. Doing so reminds us all that we have in Christ is so much better and so much greater than whatever we do not have. Now, here's the thing you have to keep in mind. You're not going to drift into a more thankful person. You're not going to just accidentally wake up and go, wow, I've developed a habit of thanksgiving. I mean, it's a discipline that you got to learn and you have to pursue. And it's not easy, especially with social media. You go on somebody, you look at somebody, your Facebook post, you look at uh, your Instagram feed, and you see everybody else's highlight reel, and they're yet another, another stunning vacation of Barbados, and their amazing Pinterest-inspired preschool snacks, and their workout of the day they're showing you on Facebook and Instagram, their kids all dressed up in adorable, adorable uh, outfits that somehow they handcrafted overnight. They're eating vegetables from the garden they planted from their backyard or the farmhouse table that they just built yesterday afternoon from pallets they found behind the local Walmart. Wait. <laughs> just makes you sick. Because then you start wondering, am I not worth enough? Am I not good enough? Am I not blessed enough? Am I not smart enough? And, and our anxiety then starts going up. So guess what happens to our gratitude? It goes down. I don't know who wrote this, but these are good words to live by. I might get this tattooed on my back. Here it is. As you go through life, make this your goal. Look at the donut and not the hole. I've never paid attention to the hole when I ate a donut. I'm just thankful for the donut, right? That's gratitude. Now, I, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't do this, it's going to totally make this sermon worthless. Here it is. I want you to get your cell phones out. Go ahead and get your cell phones out. And for you who are still in the 17th century, you can use a pen and paper if you want, okay? You guys online, join us and do this with us. I want you to start making a list either on your memo app or your note app or pen and paper. Start making a list of all the things you're thankful for right now. Right now, as I'm talking, as I'm preaching, just start making a list of all the things you're thankful for, the people in your life, the food you eat, the house you live in, maybe someone who led you to Christ, maybe a friend you know you can talk to, maybe someone who invited you to RCC. You should be four or five items by now while I'm preaching because power comes, gratitude comes when you write it down. Some of you are so focused on what you don't have that you've forgotten about what you actually do have. Now, what I would recommend you do is before you roll out of bed, that you go ahead and you just start thinking God. Because what that does, when you start thinking God early in the morning, before you start asking God for anything, it kind of opens up your mind to start seeing all the things that God blessed you with as you operate in your day. So before you do anything else, just start thinking God. God, I thank you that I woke up. I thank you for my health. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my church. It sets the tone for the day. And I'm telling you what, Here's another thing I think that helps us a lot, is that as we take the Lord's Supper, we take the Lord's Supper each and every week here at RCC. Why? Because they did it in the early church. They actually did it every single day because they got together every single day, and they had the Lord's Supper. And what that does is it cultivates a spirit of thankfulness. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share you a word, a Greek word in the, for gratitude, and it's eucharistias. Eucharistias. Everybody say that with me. Eucharistias is a word for thanksgiving that Paul uses when he writes the first Thessalonians. But if you look at this word, you can see another word inside of it, and that word is Eucharist. And Eucharist is where we get our word for Lord's Supper, where we get our word for communion. Why? Because we're thankful that instead of getting hell, which we deserve, because of, of what Jesus did for us, now we have heaven waiting for us. We're so thankful for the promise of blessing over our life because of Jesus Christ's grace over us. The cross is where every believer should begin being thankful every single day because a reminder that God has supply, has enough supply of grace that never truly ends, which leads me to the next word I want you to see within that word, and that is the word charis. Charis means grace. Grace is the core of our relationship with Jesus. From the life you're given to the food you eat, every single moment you get grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And so, if we're going to overcome anxiety, perpetual anxiety, we've got to learn to be graceful. We've got to learn to be graceful. 
And I think that's a secret to Paul when he says, you know what? I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. And many of us take that verse out of context and we slap it on a locker and we go, we're going to win the state championship this year. That's not what that means. It doesn't mean that in Christ, I'm always going to come out on top. It means even when I'm at the bottom, even when life is hard, even when life goes the way I don't want it to go, even when I'm in prison, I can, because of God's grace, be everything I am intended to be through God. I have learned, Paul says, to be content in every and any situation because God is going to supply the grace for any situation so that I am the person I'm created to be. Now, let me tell you where I think he learned this. Paul went through just a really dark time with something he was battling. It was not an irritant. This was painful. This made his life very, very hard. And he says in 2 Corinthians, three times, I begged the Lord to take it away. By the way, it's okay to beg God to take something away. But I want you to hear me. Know this. God is always going to give you what you need, not always what you want. And so God had these words for Paul. I need you to read them with me. Here they are. My what? Read them with me. Grace is all you need. My grace is all you really need. My power works best in weakness. So Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can work through me. For when I am what? Weak, then I am what? Strong. Anyone here been through a season of weakness? Raise your hand if you've ever been through a season of weakness. And we go through those seasonal weaknesses, don't we get pretty anxious? And we all want to get out of them. But listen, God wants you to get something out of them. Specifically, God wants you to get out of your time of weakness the confidence that he will sustain you by his grace. You cannot learn how strong grace is without growing through a season of weakness. you got to go through that season. You cannot learn how strong grace is unless you're in a place that you wish you could leave. Think about it. Think about it. When you go through a difficult time, a stressful time in your life, who do you talk to? Do you go to someone who looks like they've never suffered? Or do you go to someone that you know has been through a tough situation and yet they had the supernatural peace? Years ago when, um, when it looked like RCC and myself were going to come together and and I was gonna be uh, the pastor here, one of the pastors here, Um, I knew I was gonna get hammered by critics. And so I went to a veteran pastor who had been through a lot in his life, and I want you to hear me what I'm about to say, he was not cynical. He'd been through a lot of controversy in his life and he was not bitter. And I went to him and I asked him what I should do and he said to me, you always do the right thing and count on God's grace to sustain you. And here's the thing, if your solution to get through anxiety is to get to some place, I can't help you. Not only that, if I told you that's what the remedy was, that would be a total lie. To pursue peace by avoiding pain is a strategy that cannot deliver. Contingent contentment only leads to more stress. Let me put it another way. If your contentment is contingent on things you cannot control, it's only gonna mess you up more. Tomorrow is gonna, is gonna constantly be a threat to you. And so Peter had a better strategy when he wrote these words. Grow in the what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now listen, when he refers, refers to grow in the grace, he's not saying, hey, I need you to die, dive into the doctrinal understanding of grace or the etymology, etymology of grace. He says, now he's talking about supernatural. I need you to experience the supernatural empowering of grace. He's talking about growing in your capacity to receive supernatural strength from God to go through hard things and continue to do the right and honorable thing. He's talking about God redeeming the situations in your life that you want removed. C.S. Lewis was asked one time, why in the world do the righteous suffer? Why do they suffer? And I love what he said. He said, why not? They're the only ones who can handle it. You see, God doesn't give grace instead of, God gives grace in the midst of. And when you learn that, well, your weakness will then become your witness. Your supernatural peace becomes your testimony. 
to the world around you. Now, I haven't completely learned this, I gotta be honest with you, but this pilgrim right here is making progress. And you can too. So when anxiety builds up, remember this, you need to go back to school. And you need to learn and honestly look at yourself and ask if some idol in your life is getting threatened. Because a lot of times your anxiety comes because some idol in your life is being threatened. Intentionally examine your blessings, speak them out loud to God, do some homework, and remember how strong the grace of God truly, really is. And let anxiety teach you. Be a prompt. What Jesus taught us to serve them out, when you have anxiety, that's a prompt to seek first the kingdom of God. It's a trigger to seek his kingdom. To put it another way, the non-anxious life is a fruit, it's the fruit of a higher pursuit. You don't leave anxiety by gritting your teeth and saying, I'm just not going to be anxious anymore. But you learn to trust and lean into the goodness and the grace of God. And you'll leave that prison of anxiety. You stop pursuing a place. And you start trusting a person. And that person has a name. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand with me? Please stand. The one thing we need to do is that we cannot lose this. You cannot exhaust the supply of the grace of God. And that might be the most important thing you learn. And it might be the most important thing you teach someone else. Let's pray right now. Let me pray over you. Father God, I know somebody here is hearing this, either in this room or they're online right now, and they're wrestling right now with anxiety and worry. And Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to anoint this message and to take it to deep places that you need, that need to be explored in our souls. God, we cannot do this in our own strength. I'm asking for supernatural empowering to deliver us from our cell of anxiety. I'm asking for peace, God, that we cannot explain, but we cannot explain it away. I'm asking, Father, that you would allow our weakness to become our witness of your power and of your love and of your grace. And we thank you for the faithfulness and your goodness that you proved to us over and over and over again, especially in Jesus. And we pray this in his name, the whole church said, amen. I want you to know our, our, our prayer warriors are up here. They'd love to pray with you. You online can hit their, their prayer requests, and we would love to pray for those. Maybe you have something you're anxious about. Maybe a joy. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus, just like 101 people have done over the last three weeks. But I want you to know something. We're going to sing a song about, you know what? We try to fight our battles, but guess what? God has already won the war. Amen. Can we give God the praise that he's already won the war? So let's give him our worship, church. If we could be a blessing to you, why don't you come up here right now. Let's give him our worship. And men are for 
Amen, amen. Hey, well, again, thank you so much for being here. RCC, we love you. We pray today has been a blessing for you. Don't forget we have our baby bottle drive that's happening. We have a table out there. Go ahead, pick a baby bottle up. Let's fill that up and bring it back by June 20th. We love you. Go be a blessing to others. We'll see you next week. Over and